Thank you. And thank you for coming. When I say the word magic, raise your hands. How many of you think of Harry Potter? Great. How about Magic the Gathering? Some holdouts over there. <laughs> How about Disney? Great. What else do you think of when I say the word magic? What comes into your mind? Anybody? Great. What else? Yes. What else? What was that? Yes. <laughs> Oftentimes, when we think of magic, we think of witches and spells, incantations, esoteric traditions, Wicca and earth traditions, Houdini, Gandalf and Merlin, divination, Aleister Crowley, Elphaba, mysticism, the paranormal, and the occult. The word magic comes from the old Persian word, magush, to be able to have power, and is generally thought to be the art of influencing events by manipulating hidden natural or supernatural forces. We might say magic involves the use of personal intent combined with unseen forces to shape future reality. There was a time in human history, early human history, when magic, along with religion, science, even art and theater, were all the same thing. Think about that. What are the qualities of magic? One of the essential ingredients of magic is belief in things beyond your own experience. Magic invites us into that which is unknown. It invites us to cooperate with the unseen, to align ourselves with forces of nature and with the beyond. Magic also makes the impossible possible. It taps us in to options from beyond ordinary consciousness. In comparison to our everyday realities, magic is often wildly creative and imaginative. Magic is transformative. It changes us. Sometimes, magic even has a quality of conversion about it, where we move from one state of being into another. When I was a kid, I needed desperately to believe in magic. I was orphaned at birth, and before I was two years old, I'd already had five mothers, and had been a ward of the state of New York. I bounced from family to family, and by age 12, had become a ward of the state of California, too. You can imagine, I felt very alone, confused, and frightened by the unloving, unpredictable, and often violent environments in which I found myself. I looked to orphan stories, to fairy tales, and myths for clues about how to survive. It felt like the supernatural forces those works talked about were more trustworthy than the forces in plain sight. Yet though the fairy stories showed me other people performing magical acts, they didn't show me how to make magic myself. They showed me Rumpelstiltskin spinning straw into gold. But they didn't tell me how he did it, 
None of these stories did. And not knowing how pissed me off because I wanted to know how to make magic. And so I turned inward into my own dreams and visions and to my own imagination. By some definitions, I was a little crazy. But I made it work for me. Why? Because magic is real. There are unseen forces ready to collaborate with us. When I talk about my work, I like to say that I create magic in public spaces. Sometimes I say that I craft, craft contemporary urban rites that unfurl in the secular sphere, or that I create large-scale site-specific performances that transform civic landscapes into mammoth interact interactive stages and that transport audiences into mythic narratives that take place in familiar or forgotten settings. My art practice begins with tuning into what Frederick Law Olmsted might call the soul of a place. I listen to woodlands, to sidewalks and beaches, and to public green spaces. And then I dialogue with civic agents at every level and include them in the spirit of the work. My art springs from images and sounds gathered from visionary experiences and dreams which I mold into large-scale theatrical works that I call wonders. I weave fine art, live classical music, dance, sculpture. We have disciplines unusual in contemporary art making like dog training, baking, and boating to create free performances that liberate public imagination, animate a city's best aspirations, and nurture the soul of place. My work is ephemeral. It only lasts a few hours. But I believe that places can be transformed by our actions, either for good or for ill. For example, when I say the word Columbine, you likely think of a place transformed by the violent actions of two deeply troubled young men. When I say the word Woodstock, you might think of three fabulous days in the summer of 1969. Gettysburg, the site of a bloody Civil War battle where Abraham Lincoln later made his famous address. Our actions in places create a sort of energetic signature or reverberation in a place, one that transforms how people think of that site and how they treat each other within it for long afterwards. In my work with my company, we aim to transform public spaces for public good into places that are inclusive and kind places that foster cultures of generosity, imagination, and possibility. I think of this work as a kind of citywide North American magical realism. Here's some images from what's probably my best known work called Lullaby Moon. These free participatory performances took place on each new moon for an entire lunar year, beginning in the fall of 2008.
<laughs> That's not quite Lullaby Moon. <laughs> Dance party? <laughs> <laughs> Lullaby Moon grew out of a vision I had 13 years ago. It came over me in a flash and lasted maybe three or four seconds. This may sound odd, I know, but one fall afternoon, I suddenly found myself standing in another world. It was the most beautiful place I've ever seen. It was a city, a plaza with a giant sort of dome-shaped cathedral library on one side, and another curious-looking great hall on the other. But what made this site so beautiful was a substance from which everything was made. All of the buildings, all of the flowers, the creatures inhabiting this place, everything was made from what I can only describe as a kind of light love substance that emanated from everything and made me feel more at home and more at peace than ever. It resembled no place I've been to in this reality. A few days after this vision, I started receiving messages from these otherworldly beings in the form of what I like to call holographic thought bundles. They weren't thoughts as we know them or ideas. They were coming from somewhere else, from these sort of equine mothers I call horse mothers, and these very jolly, long-eared, moon-drunk creatures, these grandmother bird beings, plus a whole family 
of what I could only describe as clocks. The gist of their message was this. They wanted to come into this world to give a series of blessings in Seattle. So I got right to work. This is what became Lullaby Moon. It took me a long time to translate the vision of the City of Light into something that was playable by actors and dancers in real time and space. And though the work is very visual and entails lots and lots of props and costumes, all of that is just a doorway into the real magic. The visual and musical sensibilities were crafted to bypass fear responses in the brain that keep otherworldly forces from getting in. Humans can be so wary of things appearing unfamiliar or people seeming other. So I employed a kind of soft-edged aesthetic nostalgia to help people pass through the veil, as they say, and gain passage into what I called the city of light. The real work was figuring out how to train the performers, the musicians, and the whole creative and technical team to impart the spirit of love and quiet gentleness that epitomize these otherworldly beings. So I started experimenting with ways to create atmospheres of kindness, atmospheres permeated with a broad kind of love. Over the course of the year of monthly performances, I started to realize that something very special was happening. I started receiving letters from people, like this one. Then we received this note from a woman named Caroline. She wrote, I went to Lullaby Moon with my friends and their young children. One of them, who is three years old, recently got adopted from Guatemala, where she spent most of her life in the basement of an orphanage. Because of that, her seeing is very bad, and she has difficulties relating with others. But then, she heard the music and felt the lullaby moon energy, and she started dancing and was so happy the whole evening. Thank you and all the lullaby moon people for the wonderful work you're doing. Our cities need magic. Seattle needs magic. Corporate culture and socioeconomic stratification have drained public life of the joys of once, what we once called community and replaced simple human kindness with stuff. When I walk around Seattle, I wonder, are we already under the enchantment of some powerful sorcerers? Bill Gates. Mark Zuckerberg. Steve Jobs. Or have we been ensorcelled by another potent spell, the spell of advertising which would have us believe that buying that iPhone 7 or that new yellow Miata or another pair of Jimmy Choo pumps will transform us as if by magic and will at last be fulfilled. As much as I love 
Harry Potter. I gotta say, Harry learns he's a wizard. And what's the next thing that happens? They take him shopping. No secret oaths, no incantations. For his first magical rite of passage, he visits the bank and goes on a shopping spree. The French uber intellectual Herbert Marcuse said, capitalism will co-opt everything except for obscenity. And now we know that he was wrong about that last part as well. I'll tell you what I've decided. Magic has been co-opted by consumer society. It's been disnified and is being used by disingenuous wizarding, ooh, disingenuous marketing wizards to make us buy more shit. And by so doing, they've stripped magic of most of its power to help us. Please understand, magic is real. There are unseen forces waiting to collaborate with us. This culture is screwed up. We need a transformation. We need some kind of magic. We need more magic makers. Is what we're doing today to solve homelessness working? And the things we're doing to stop wars, wars killing thousands of children, across the world, are they working? And what about income inequality? Are the things we're doing, we, the richest country in the history of the world, solving the problem or making it worse? Especially here in Boomtown, Seattle. Once we replace bogus magic with a kind of genuine, untainted magic a part of us longs for and needs, I believe we will begin to alleviate the hopelessness, alienation, discord, and violence that plague our cities. Here's an example. From 2012 and to 2015, I was artist in residence across the lake in Redmond, where I was charged with creating opportunities for that city's multicultural and extremely diverse population comprised of tech workers from all over the world, opportunities for them to come together in public space in ways that made everyone feel more a part of the community and more at home. When you walk down the street in Redmond, you hear people speaking Russian, Chinese, Tamil, Spanish, and Hindi. While Redmond wasn't particu a particularly violent place, it was subtly balkanized after hours. Our work there was an experiment in creating joyful, connected culture within a pluralistic, internationally diverse community. Dearly beloved, we have assembled here today
queen. Sugar station! The Maypole Dance! V, it's very, very extraordinary. E is even more than anyone that you adore. And love is all that I can give to you. Love is more than just a game for two. Two in love can make it take my don't break it loud Make for me and Love was made for me and you Oh, Professor Professor That was lovely If you brought a cake to share Say Happy Apple Noon <laughs> Magic might not be the only solution, but it is the only solution all of us can use right now, today, when we walk out the door. How do we, as city dwellers in the digital age, cultivate magic in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our public places? Most magicians won't ever say how they do their magic, but I'm going to share with you how I make mine. We're going to do a tiny experiment in magic making. If you'll all stand up, please. And find a partner, somebody next to you or nearby. Now, I'd like you to face your partner. And so you're going to face your partner. And I'd like you to look into their eyes. It might feel awkward and kind of weird. Yeah, you can do it. So see what happens if you just breathe. 
You're just going to breathe. You're just going to breathe. And we're going to do this silently. Just going to breathe. It's okay that it's awkward. It's okay that it feels funny or weird. Just breathe. Look into your look into your partner's eyes. And without saying anything at all, I'd like you to invite them to see you, to be with you, so that you can be with them. Great. Keep breathing. Now, still in silence, I'd like you to notice something beautiful about your partner. Notice something beautiful. And something else that's beautiful about them. And another thing that's beautiful about your partner. Keep breathing. Now, silently, I'd like you to make a wish for your partner. Wish them good health or happiness, or kindness, or joy, this very day. Good. Now keep going with that. Make another wish for your partner. And another. Wonderful. Now, let go of that and close your eyes. Make a wish for yourself. And one for all of us including all of the people working behind the scenes who made this morning possible. Make a wish for our city. One for this whole wide world. One for all beings, everywhere. And one more for you. Now, before you open your eyes, take another breath and notice your whole self Notice the spirit of this place. Excellent. Great. And when you're ready, please return to your seats.
changing the world, begins with the habit of looking at each other with loving eyes. It's the first lesson in magic I teach my performers. And through weeks and months and even years of rehearsals, they learn to do it genuinely, reliably, and from the heart. As vital as this is in my shows, it spills over into the rest of their lives. Those unseen forces waiting for us? Gandalf himself would also insist. They are love. Everyday kindness. Compassion. These are the foundation of true magic. They make the impossible possible. You may think this sounds naive, but transforming our communities and eventually our world begins with being willing to look at each other with kind eyes to see the beauty, the humanity in each other. It starts with each one of us. This is how good magic always begins and how fractured communities can start to heal. Thank you. questions? Yeah. Oh, I love that you asked that. Uh, so right now, I am artist in residence at uh, ACT Theater here in Seattle. It's a project funded by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, where we are looking at the intersection between theater technology, gaming culture, and the quality of public life. Uh, it's a big puzzle, and I have formed a 20-person think tank, an act comprised of, oh gosh, um, all different kinds of artists, makers, dreamers, tinkerers, uh, um, inventors, and um, we are, my, my project there is a 15-month project, so um, it really is a dreaming time for us, and um, one of the reasons why I'm so glad you asked was because we are looking for collaborators, and if you are interested in being in conversation and in dialogue with us, uh, and civic forces to create uh, new possibilities around engagement in public life. I would love to hear from you. This is my personal invitation to you, and this is how you reach me. So please do, if you are at all curious, be in touch. I would love to hear from you. Yeah, up in the back. I don't really think about it as selling magic. I basically uh, 
take projects that um, where I feel like the situation needs us for some reason. Uh, usually we're working on shoestring budgets and uh, there's my collaborators and all the performers and uh, everyone, for everyone, it's kind of a huge labor of love no matter what. So uh, that's the first part of the answer. Uh, I would say the second part is through changes we see in the civic landscape, how people treat each other, how people talk about their city, and also letters that I receive. So, uh, for example, like with Lullaby Moon, I still get letters about that show. The last time we did a Lullaby Moon in Seattle uh, was in 2010, and I still get at least two or three letters, if not more, every month from audience members who would like to see the work again or feel that they need it in some way. So, yeah, that's, does that answer your question? Great. Who else? Uh, well, uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, and uh, there are more and more companies and people venturing in to that kind of theater making. Uh, I think especially when you're working in a site specifically in the public realm, there's a huge amount of safety issues that have to be attended to uh, because the most important thing is we keep everyone safe. Um, it's it's a lot of work. It's a lot of schlepping and uh, involves a lot of dialogue with civic agents. Um, for me, um, since I grew up uh, relating with institutions uh, kind of in a familial sort of way, uh, because of my background as an orphan and a ward and all of that, my, my, the way I relate with institutions, I kind of treat them a little bit like family. So I'm willing to go into a meeting with, you know, the Department of Neighborhoods and the Police Department and the Fire Department and all of those people and sort of pitch these sort of crazy ideas and say, I want to float a three-foot, you know, a, a three-story foot, a three-story swan on the lake. You know, and uh, over time, what happens is, is that you develop trust with those civic organizations. And that is something that takes time. Yeah. Who else? Here? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Well, the first answer is that I did a lot of personal work. Uh, decades <laughs> of uh, looking at myself and um, overcoming lots of grief and um, listening to sort of those deep um, yearnings um, around what the gifts that, that I might have to give really are. Uh, the other answer, I would say, has to do with skill building. So I'm a classical singer and a theater artist and a sculptor, uh, and also have to use a lot of kind of interpersonal skills to do what I do, uh, to lead large groups of people or to deal with cities. Uh, and then, um, I also, but you know, even then, even when I had these visions and I knew that I was supposed to do this work, it was really challenging, uh, especially when I first started, because it felt like a lot of Lucia and sort of too much to put out there. It was too big, too much, too yada, 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 yada. And I felt really shy about it. I didn't know that um, it was okay to be that big or to take up that much space or to really reveal who I am as a person and an artist in that way and also to invite 
tons of other people into that vision. So um, I did a little writing about this actually for Creative Mornings where uh, I really remember I was in the bathtub sort of, sort of struggling with all of this, doing a singing practice that I do, and, and um, suddenly it really just kind of came to me that, that if I move towards my big dream, if I live that, that other people, other girls or women or misfits or men or people who feel like they don't belong or feel like they're orphans or whatever, that maybe they will have the courage to live their big dreams too. And that was what gave me, it was almost like the, the, that idea was larger than my fear. And I felt like if I moved toward that, then I was doing my part towards building soulful society. Who else? Yes. Random acts of culture, you mean? <laughs> um, Lullaby Moon, so uh, documenting site-specific work is uh, a real issue, especially when um, trying to get grants and so forth. Uh, you know, usually with grants, they want to see one unedited cut of a piece, and it's very, they're very sort of biased towards proscenium-based work. So when you are uh, making work that covers square miles of the civic landscape, it's very challenging to document that. Also, I have this thing about um, not necessarily wanting the photographers to be so close to the action. You know, if they're going to be there, if they're going to get that close, then they need to come to rehearsal <laughs> and have a costume, and in fact, uh, the camera obscura character, he, that was inspired by uh, a certain photographer, a friend of mine, who, who likes to get in on the action. Yeah. Something else? Yeah. A villain. You know, I would say that the that <laughs> that contemporary culture is the villain, and that uh, that sort of disjunctive moment is between uh, ordinary reality and extraordinary reality. And so, in that sense, each audience member slash participant is. Uh, their own protagonist in the narrative. And I think about it as world building, and I'm really interested in doing what I can to fo foster peaceful society. I think that we have enough images of violence around us all the time, and I'm interested in fostering a culture of gentleness. So, not so much. Anything else? Yeah. I would love to. Yeah, the scale of the work is pretty big. It, it, it takes a lot to move things around. Uh, but uh, if there are cities that are interested, I would be absolutely happy to have a conversation. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's part of it, right? We're cooperating with unseen forces. So sure. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, as I said in the beginning, there's, uh, in early human history, magic and religion were really the same thing. Yeah.
Um, yeah. Can you get a little bit more specific about that question? I do, I do. I, um, sometimes it's by the absence of problems. You know, other times it's uh, through moments. Uh, like this one time we were doing a show at Green Lake and um, the three uh, giant rabbits were riding their penny farthing bicycles around the lake and there was this little girl and um, she was running ahead of them, uh, uh, running, running behind them and way out in front of her parents. She was probably four. And she was just totally enraptured. And she was like, the bunnies, the bunnies, the bunnies. And, and one of them turned around and um, waved at her. And she turned around to her parents and she was like, at me. And for me, that was it. If that was the only transformation that little girls experience, that, that was enough. Other times, you know, it's something else. It's something ephemeral that can't really be caught on video. It's an it's a atmosphere or sort of a feeling in the air with the audience where you really feel that we're, we're in kind of a, a sacred space. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, since I sometimes, if not often, am also performing in the shows, uh, I, there's a point at which it's usually pretty awkward and messy. I'm getting better at it, but it's a little messy where I, thank you guys for coming, by the way, um, where I, um, I have to transition into a performer. And um, uh, that's when I, I let go of myself as a director and I step into myself as a character in the performance. And I have a lot, and I, in which I have a lot of work to do. So uh, if I'm performing, that's really the path that I'm taking. Um, if I'm not performing, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm sort of uh, keeping a kind of a unified field of attention over the whole performance and really sort of sending my love and good wishes to the audience. So I'm working so mat pretty much no matter what. Yeah, anybody else? Yes. Yeah, um, well how do any of us do that? I think they've sort of, there are thoughts that feel right somehow. It's like they've sort of settle in this way where they can um, kind of take weight. And if they feel kind of flimsy or like they don't, um, uh, they can't support the, the, the big vision of the work, then, uh, then I don't go with those. So it has to, they have to, I think, whole as much as I can. And if the part doesn't support the whole, then it goes bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one more question? Anybody? Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, I have. I have. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful place. And uh, I uh, have um, practices that I do uh, pretty much every day that um, kind of sort of tune me in to those worlds. And I think all of us, you know, those of us who have practice lives and whatever we do, uh, you know, finding those places reliably is a big deal. Great. Thank you all so much.